Hello and welcome to the PhD Life Raft podcast. I'm Emma Brzezinski and today I am talking to the wonderful Nathan Ryder. Nathan has particular expertise in supporting PhD students, particularly as they're preparing for their Viva. And so today we talk about the process in leading up to that and how to develop your confidence um, as you prepare for that event. And also just the importance of keeping going. So I do hope you enjoy this episode. Good morning, Nathan. Good morning, Emma. Thank you so much for being here. I've been really looking forward to meeting you. Um, I came across you in one of my many Google experiences <laughs> and I saw your work um, about surviving your Viva. And I just, I loved the the way that you were approaching that, the really positive tone of it. Well, and so I, I asked you to come and, and talk a bit more about that. And I'm delighted that you said yes. Thank you. Well, happy to be here. Super. And so I always start with asking people about a bit about their own journey. So can you tell us a little bit about your journey through the PhD and out the other side? Yeah, so I um, I did my undergrad at the University of Liverpool and I was a mathematician philosopher for three years. Um, and after that, I did, a, I did a master's in maths because I sort of realised that that's more where my strengths were and, and also where my passion was. Um, and after my master's, I uh, just continued working with the same supervisor. So I was really fortunate and I was really naive uh, as well because I just uh, applied for it thinking, oh, I, I hope I get this. Um, and I, I wasn't really sure what I was going to do if I didn't. Um, and thankfully, both my supervisor said yes and the department said yes. And I got funding to do that for, for three and a half years. So. Brilliant. Uh, between 2004 and 2008, uh, I was a pure mathematician. Um, yeah, um, I I had a really supportive supervisor. Um, that's uh, I worked hard, but I don't think if if I hadn't had that person, his name was uh, Hugh Morton. If I hadn't had him for my supervisor, um, I don't think I would have got started well. Um, I don't think yes. I, I would have sort of persisted because uh, he was. He was so patient because, as I said, I, I was very happy to work. But when I started, I really I don't think I knew what I was letting myself in for, really. Mm, mm, mm. And I think that that's come up so many times. And I'm very glad that you've given a shout out to the supportive supervisors. This is what we need to do. We need to celebrate them and the importance of having a good supervisor and how, yes, that that that, that help in navigating the journey. Really, really important. Um, so tell us then a little bit about the other side then of coming out of the PhD and what happened next. So I, I suppose maybe like a lot of people, I don't know, but in my third year, I was thinking, you know, I, I quite like, I quite like the research environment that I'm in. Uh, and that was probably very particular to sort of the group of people I had around me and, and that sense of community we had in our departments. And so I, I did think about postdocs for a little while. Um, and, and I remember actually a meeting with my supervisor and second supervisor bringing that up. And and they didn't quite say no. They just looked surprised. They looked surprised <laughs> like, oh, you're thinking of doing a po- oh, okay. Oh, okay then. Um, and I sort of went away from that meeting. And you know when you can sort of read the room? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking, okay, so, so I'm probably going to finish my PhD, but they probably also don't think that whatever you need to continue, I'm, maybe I'm not displaying that, maybe I've not done that. So I did start thinking about what I would do when I finished. And thankfully, uh, in parallel to doing my PhD, I'd also done some work with the um, uh, researcher developers at Liverpool. So I've been invited to be um, an administrator and sort of like an, an assistant on a couple of residential workshops. Uh, some mm-hmm. people listening might have heard of grad schools, um, like there used to be a national grad school program in the UK. And really there's sort of like a combination of like team building and um, sometimes people call it transferable skills development, things like that. Uh, these were particularly focused on career skills. 
And I'd already been through the program myself and thought it was really interesting. And so when I was invited back just to kind of help, um, it was kind of like um, going through the gateway and realizing that there's there's something else in um, research education, if you like, you know, there's the path that I was on, which was doing the, the research and trying to get a PhD. And then there was sort of my supervisor and department who were actively trying to help me with the research. But then there was also this, um, this parallel track of people who were trying to make sure that the environment was good for everybody and trying mm. to show that there were, there were skills that people needed or skills that they might find valuable mm. and trying to do things to support that. And I was like really like on the outside looking in and seeing all these people, like really talented people with, with PhDs who weren't using their research at all, but were using sort of the skills uh, mm. that they developed over the course of a PhD and then trying to share some of that in lots of different ways. And so I just kind of got interested. And when I finished um, in the sort of summer of 2008, uh, I had a couple of weeks of thinking, well, what do I do now? And then uh, I kind of just, <laughs> I don't really remember sort of like the day that I thought I'm gonna do this, but I made a decision and started working as a researcher developer. I think at the time I just called myself a skills trainer because I didn't know what else to call myself. Because uh, again, I was just jumping into this thing thinking, I'll probably, this will probably work out. And if it doesn't, I'll probably work something else out. Mm. And that was 2008. Um, and eventually uh, I got interested in the Viva. And that was a few years after that. And it did work out. It did work out. I love it. And I it love does. this this theme that's come up again with, with other people in terms of something else that you were doing on the side with a PhD then came through more strongly afterwards. And I, I think that that is really worth people listening to in terms of it, because I think sometimes people feel like they're wasting time if they're not focusing on the pitch solely on the, the research aspect. And actually those peri su supposedly peripheral things can be the golden ticket. You know, that can be the thing that, that takes you forward afterwards. So just to encourage people to remember that really. Um, yeah, and it did work out for you because this is this is now what you do. So you support people with a particular focus on the Viva. Yeah, that's that's what it's grown to. Um, so I spent I, I've been doing this. I've been working as a researcher developer for nearly thirteen years. Amazing. And for over ten of those, I've had this kind of like growing interest in the Viva. And I'd say certainly for the last two or three years. It's not the thing that I do exclusively, but it's usually if someone gets in touch with me, it's because they've heard about it um, and, and some of the work that I do. So I, I started um, in 2010 just with um, a colleague, uh, Deanne Johnson at the University of Manchester, just got in touch and said, we want, we want somebody to do a Viva Survivor workshop. And that's that's what they asked for uh, by name. I, I, um, I said yes. Um, and again, Maybe some of what I'm saying today sounds like I've just had this incredible streak of luck, <laughs> but I, I said yes at the time because um, uh, because I was paying for a wedding. <laughs> you know, I was, <laughs> me, and my, me and my wife were saving up. Me and my wife were saving up. This was around June, July, 2010, <laughs> and our wedding was in October. And I was thinking, you know, uh, this is this is great. You know, I'll, um, I was I just said yes and sort of worked with them to figure out kind of like what kind of learning objectives they wanted for the session and went to do it uh, incredibly nervous uh, as you would be doing something like this for the first time maybe and uh, before we started I, I just remember Deanne or one of her colleagues coming up and saying actually um, I know we agreed that there would be I think maybe like 25 people something like that but um, but we've got a waiting list of 30 so do you think you can come back next week and and I said yes because <laughs> obviously work. And the thing is, for a while, it was just um, the University of Manchester. And, and I would go there in the end, sort of three or four times a year. Um, but then another institution heard about it and they asked me and and it, and it really snowballed. So I went from doing like three or four a year to uh, to be before the pandemic, doing 50 a year uh, around the UK wow. and and then doing other things to support that. So um, uh, a couple of years after I started, because I wanted to learn more. As I thought I had I had a sort of handle on trying to steer people through some of the questions they might have or some ideas of how they could get ready for their viva but um 
my viva as i was talking to more and more people about them i realized that my viva was pretty uh, atypical you know i i had a viva that was 4 hours long which isn't it's not like the longest viva i've ever heard of but it's it's pretty long mm. um i had a viva which started with a presentation because that's what i was asked to do but nice. very quickly my examiners started asking me questions and they went horrible or mean but I realized when we took a break at two and a half hours that I hadn't sat down yet, that I'd started, mm-hmm. stood up by this chalkboard and was still there sort of responding to questions. And, and that was OK. It was tiring, but but it was fine. Uh, and I also knew that it really wasn't typical. So I, I started a podcast because podcasts are great. Um, they are I, great. We love them. <laughs> and, and I started interviewing people about their experiences, uh, just asking, you know, what it's kind of like like how you start your podcast, Emma, you know, how, what did you do for your PhD? What was that process like? And then starting to ask them about how they got ready for their Viva uh, and what happened. And so I did this for about 60 interviews I, and also used that sort of platform that I was building to do to do more research and, and put little surveys out and, and find out what people's experiences were like so that then... As I was continuing to do these uh, workshops or seminars, whatever you would call them, uh, I was able to say to people, you know, you're 85% likely to get minor corrections. So your work's not going to be perfect, but it is going to be pretty good. You know, your your Viva is likely to be, I can't give you a guarantee on how long it's going to be, but, you know, any expectations that it's going to be all day, you know, you can pretty much put those to one side. It's probably going to be a couple of hours Mm. and just being able to share more and more expectations with people really started to, I could see it starting to help uh, more and more. Yes. Cause I think there's, there's a gorgeous thing about it being a unique event for someone because it is a unique event, but also it's a terrifying thing that it's a unique event. (laughs) So actually it's like you say, to be able to say there, there's some, it's likely that, so that at least there's some kind of navigational hooks for people. <laughs> that seems really, yeah. really useful. And also that you will survive it. I think that message that it, it, it will be okay. You will be okay. I mean, I just remember in my Viva, literally my legs buckled beneath me. It's that, it's that stressful, isn't it? We know that. Yeah. But actually to be able to have some kind of information and prepare yourself, um, brilliant idea. So... Now, I want to grill you (laughs) in terms of are there what sort of then? So, the sense of providing people with some sort of general ideas, what else um, happens in these in these workshops? Oh, well, well, what I want to say just from the top is I call my stuff like Viva Survivor and I still have this like Viva Survivors but the term sort of predates my interest I think there's a book called Surviving Your Viva from around 2003 so the idea was out there was out there before um one of the things that I like to try and steer people with really early on is um people think of survive and they think it's going to be life or death you know it's it's like cast away you know Tom Hanks and it's impossible odds and you just about make it through whereas the definition of survive is manage to keep going in difficult circumstances. Mm. It shouldn't be an overwhelming struggle. It shouldn't be seen as this impossible set of circumstances. Um, the thing I always try and focus on with people is that right in the centre of the definition, it's keep going. Mm. You know, if you've got to submission, you're overwhelmingly likely to succeed. Yes, 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 yes. So what can we then do with that? Um, there's a, an American writer, a presenter um, called Seth Godin. That's G-O-D-I-N. I love I-N, him. Sorry. And I, yeah, I really love his work. And from that and from other people that I've read over the years, um, I've seen lots of people write about how um, some, something be, people being nervous about something doesn't mean that that thing is inherently bad. Mm. It's usually this anticipation of something that's important Mm. and that's something that I try to throughout you know whatever sessions I do I really try and dig into that you know of course of course this thing this viva is important because you know it's maybe not quite the end of your PhD but it's it's pretty close you know it's it's an examination you've invested loads of time before that into getting your research good and to getting your thesis as good as you can and of course you're going to be nervous because you want this thing to go well but um 
that doesn't mean that it's going to be a bad experience. It doesn't mean it's going to be a hard experience. Mm. Um, it's going to be a challenge. It's going to be a difficult challenge because, um, you know, you don't know at the start exactly what your examiners are going to say or what questions exactly they might have. Um, but by the time you get to submission, you must be good at overcoming difficult challenges. Mm. You know, it, the last uh, 12 months will not have been comfortable for anyone listening, I imagine, and it's particularly mm. anyone doing a PhD. Mm. But if you are listening, you have overcome those challenges. Mm. And having done that and having invested all the time that you have in a PhD, the Viva, it's not just one more challenge, but we can view it as, as a, another challenge that you will overcome. Absolutely. Oh, I love this so much. And I think also to remember um, in terms of the examiner, from an examiner's point of view, when I'm examining a PhD, I am genuinely looking forward to talking to someone about their work not there to kind of trip them up or make it horrible for them. Like you say, I don't want it to be a horrible experience. Yeah. It's got to be rigorous. Of course it has to be, but it comes from a place of genuine interest and inquiry um, and wanting to talk about that material. So this, this yeah. sense of, of, yeah, that it's, it's a, it is a defense of your work, but from a, hopefully from a place of, if not generosity, then at least interest. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the things that's been really useful for me as well, because I, I have done this, I mean, as you can imagine, if you've delivered any any lectures or presentations several times, it's never the same twice, yes. but you do get more confident with it. So I've done, um, later this week, when we're recording this in, in I'll be... I'll be delivering my 275th Fiverr Survivor session. <laughs> Amazing. Do you get a special T-shirt? I want that, 275. <laughs> I don't know, maybe for 300, maybe for 300. Okay, I'm going to hold like, you I, to I, that. I want a picture of I, it. <laughs> <laughs> but like I do, I, I, the thing is, I, I keep track of that because it's sort of like this useful reminder to me because like I get nervous before I do any of these. Like yes. I did. I did one last week and because of uh, because of the lockdown at the start of this year, I made the decision to cancel all of my half day sessions and just replace them where possible with shorter ones because, you know, we were homeschooling and then there's the added stress and pressure of like the world and how it is. And so I had like a four month gap between delivering Viva Survivors. So I was nervous. You know, I, I had all my notes. It was like 273 or whatever, but I was still, I'm still nervous, but knowing, like I've, I've invested a lot in this. Yes. Um, so this is, this could be a challenge that I might forget, like the flow of something. I might, you know, click a slide and think, oh, what, uh, what's my, what's my lead in here? But, but I have done this, and and I can, I can be nervous, but I can also be confident, and that's that's one of the biggest takeaway messages that I, I try to put across in, in all the work that I do, which is that. By the time people get to their Viva, um, they might be nervous, but they've certainly got enough talent and enough experience to to bring to that challenge. You know, they. I think I, I again because of a mathematical background, I um I've done some back of the napkin calculations before, and my my estimate is that by the time people get to their Viva, which is typically two to three hours, something like that. They've probably invested between five and a half and six thousand hours into the doctoral journey. Wow. So, you know, if I imagine as well for anyone who's part-time and listening, if you're doing a part-time PhD, you probably invest a lot more than yes, that. Absolutely. Just in all the thinking and all the little bits that you get in here and there. Um, you do have to do some prep after you submit, but it's the five and a half to six thousand hours that is going to get you through the the Viva. Yes, yes. And, and I oh sorry. No, no, go on. I was just going to say, I love that, that the, the metaphor um, of, of kind of being there delivering the lecture and having people there, they come to the lecture because they want to hear about it. That's it. And it's exactly like that in the vibe, isn't it? Yeah. People are there because they yeah. want to hear what you've got to say in, in a kind of, this is really interesting. We're going to write it down because it's interesting. And so that sense of, yeah, of you have the experience. Oh, I love this. Love it. So, um, Yeah. So I'm going to press you now then for some for some top tips. Which that's for one top tip, um, but if you have more, they're very welcome. 
<laughs> okay. Uh, so I think, so building on that idea of confidence then and sort of my own sort of record keeping, I, I would really encourage people who've, who've got their Viber coming up. Yeah, you know, it, it's going to help you to read your thesis. It might help you to have a mock vibe or to talk with people. Um, I think it's really going to help if you take a little bit of time and sit back and think about your achievements over the course of your PhD. Because I think for a lot of people, progress comes in fits and starts. It's it's really, like you might suddenly have these breakthrough moments where you think, oh, I've achieved something. And then I've had like two months before then where you feel like you're just grinding and grinding and not seeing any results. Um, mm. However it works for you, just make a note of all the things you've done where you can, where you can point and say, I did this. Mm. You know, whether that's you got a paper written, whether it's finishing your first draft of a chapter, like success in some kind of practical elements of your research, or even when you you realise like you understand something, you know, you've yes, gone from yes. a place of thinking, what does this mean? And you know that you learned this. Because if you yes. if you tally all those things together, you'll see the story of somebody who's really developed during their PhD. Uh, yes. That Again, that person who isn't perfect, but you certainly put the hours in. You've certainly developed yourself and you've certainly done enough work to to justify being there and passing the viva. Like you can still be nervous, but if you reflect on all that talent and that work, you should find enough confidence for yourself to kind of to put the nerves in perspective. Brilliant. Brilliant. And like I say, it, 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 this is a mindset game. This is a mindset oh, game. Yes. And, and, and absolutely putting yourself in that confident mindset fantastic and anything else or because um, I just I, I'm only saying that because I heard a like you were going to say something else but that's more than enough to be going on with <laughs> well we'll see if it, if it makes the edit I'll just say um my website viva survivors viva-survivors.com it does have that podcast archive we talked about before Brilliant. but uh, for just over four years it's been a daily blog about the viva so every day people can go and find something new whether that's about expectations or preparation or confidence. And of course, I, I, as with your podcast, there are ways for people to get that sent to them when it when it comes up. So, yeah. A, a daily, I respect to you in terms of that commitment. <laughs> daily blog, I love it. Um, Nathan, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time, for your wisdom, for all the work that you're doing in this area, because this is it's it can be a time of real anxiety for people and just hearing you speak calmly and clearly about it um i I know it's going to be really helpful to people thank you so much for being here today yeah thank you i'm just very very happy to be invited thank you thank you